this is Brian McCarthy, yeah, for the National Lampoon Radio Network, and you are watching ComedyMatters.tv with the legendary Jeffrey Goering. Okay, I moved to New York City from Baltimore, not to brag, uh, in 1990, 17 years old, just a, just a pair of gym shorts and a tube of chapstick. I would see this, this man at these events, and he had this crazy, fucking straight up hair and he had a giant scarf around his neck. But you'd be with these magnificent women, these Nubian goddesses or these these Asian, I don't know where you'd find these girls or what. And I'd always see the Chris, I'm like, who is that guy? <laughs> Did you ever find out who it was? Well, he would tell me. He would say, that's Jeffrey Curry. He's a, he's a comedy writer and he's a comedy guy. Now, I am fascinated by you for a number of reasons. I, I did uh, my you know my usual eight minutes of show uh, show prep, and you've been locking this look in for twenty years. This yeah, has exactly. been a look for twenty years. I, you choose a look and you go with yes, it. Yes, I think that's my brand. Because I'm looking at older pictures of you, like when you were with Milton Berle and some of these old you know the red buttons or the <laughs> any young man, yeah, you know, man artist way decades ago. Yeah, but then you had you had shorter hair, and when you were younger, you had a mustache. Right. And I think you better that mustache in my wallet now because well, I don't need it. Yeah. Right, then with the TSA, you know, right, the TSA, you have to like put it in the little bucket and it goes through exactly. the security. Let's just start, if you don't mind, at the very beginning. How did you first get involved in comedy? And also, if I may ask, where did you grow up? I grew I was born in the Bronx, but okay. I grew up in Yonkers, actually. Okay. All right. And went off to school in Philadelphia. Uh, what, what school? Temple or? Temple University. Okay, cool. Yeah, great, yeah, great. Exactly. All right. Uh, how I got started in comedy. It was a really weird story. I had been writing stuff since I was 12 years old. Okay. I was always writing stuff. Okay. And then I started making these little films, and they were very... Super, like super 8? Super 8 films. Okay. And they were kind of bizarre films. I was doing things like, uh, it was comedy news. Like, uh, I, I would do a bit like, several men were arrested for smearing cream cheese on the ankles of elderly women who wore their stockings rolled down like bagels. That's funny. Have you ever seen the old women with the stockings like that? Absolutely. It looks like bagels. So I got my grandmother, who was a wonderful person, had a great sense of humor. She let me put cream cheese on her ankles. She said, Jeffrey, only for you would I do this. That's funny. Her name was Mrs. O'Goyam. She was here, newly from Ireland. Okay. And she told this great story about how she She's like, you know, we have two kinds of stockings, milk stockings and meat stockings. I know you're Jewish. Right. So you have flesha dick stockings and milk dick stockings. Right. And this crazy man, he put cream cheese on my flesha dick stockings and I can't get it off. So I filmed that. And then I did stories like uh, The Masters of Disguise. It was based on master criminals who disguised themselves as inanimate objects. Okay. So it started out as two men disguised as coats from a hat store. Oh, nice. They come in over the arms of two other men who swear they had no part in the whole thing, and they say, just act naturally like we're your coats and nobody will get hurt. That's and funny. so I did many crimes like that. Two men disguised as a pair of eyeglasses okay. or a local optometrist okay. come in on, on another man's face. And they always say the same thing, just act natural like wear your glasses and nobody will get hurt. Like, very cerebral stuff. Now, when you 15, 12, 19, I mean, is it high college? Well, when I, you know, there were rumors that I used to be a dentist. Did you know that? I, I knew you were. Aren't you still a dentist now? Well, those are just rumors. Okay. Which is very strange. And do you know when those rumors started? I have no idea. The day I graduated from dental school. <laughs> and they have not <laughs> let up. It's amazing. So Michael Eisner, Michael Lopez, so many men have been accused of being dentists. I think it's a Jewish thing. It is. It they is. accuse us of being dentists. Gay is a day. So I was in, in dental school. Okay. The time. I was, but I was very young. Yeah, twenty. I was like, yeah, I was like twenty-one, twenty-two. Okay. And that's when I first met Woody Allen. There were only three people I ever wanted to meet: Woody Allen, Salvador Dali, and the Beach Boys. And I met them all. Okay. Yeah. Even Brian Wilson. The whole Beach Boys as a group. Wow. Yeah, I know. So, okay. okay. so, okay. so I, I was determined to meet Woody Allen because I had been writing these things for many years, and everybody said they're very Woody Allen ish. Uh, give me a time frame because I know, I know in my head, I know we're thinking, give me a movie or a bananas. Well, it was um, when Woody was in Play It Again Sam. Okay, so that would be like 68, maybe. Yeah, maybe 70, a little later than that. 72. A little later than okay. that. Yeah. Okay, okay. But yeah, same with him. He, 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 he played like, the Bogart, the Bogart movie. It was movie. a long time ago. Right. He was starring with Tony Roberts. Okay. And so what I did was, I was driving a pimp mobile in those days, which was a car that had been made for one of the Isley brothers. Uh, it was a Mandarin Orange Eldorado. Which is that? I bought it from Dick Gidron Cadillac in the Bronx. <laughs> and, and, Believe me, no white men ever drove a car like that. My wife used to say to me, we're Jewish and we live in Scarsdale. Why do I have to drive an orange Cadillac? I, I bought the car, I pimped it out, I put a Rolls Royce grill on it, 
Did she grabs in the back, I swear. And had a big white wall tire. Did you do this as a goof? No, right. this was part of my life. I just was it like an ironic thing that you did? Like I was living in a fantasy at the time. Okay. I I, I wore leather clothes. I had okay. very long hair. That's I great. just I, I just I hate stereotypes, sure. and I have always hated sure, stereotypes. Sure, sure. I don't think you should be able to look at a person and tell what they do just by looking at them. Of course. I think you should do what you love and look the way you like, and they don't necessarily have to coincide. So what I started doing was I was started uh, going to the theater where Woody was performing okay. and leaving little notes with the stage manager on the back of my dental school cards as if I knew him already. Okay. I said, Woody, I haven't seen you in a long time. I'll be down to the show to see you. And I added little strange things that I'm bringing my cardboard thumb. I thought I'd have to write something very sure, bizarre to sure. get his attention. Sure, so my cardboard thumb was all I could come up with. Uh -huh. So I also knew that if you're going to go meet a guy, you, eat, you have to prove that you're sane, or else why would they speak to you? Right. And there's only two ways to prove you're sane. You either wear a tie, or you bring a pretty girl with you. Yes. I didn't have a tie, and I knew one pretty girl, and she hated me. We had just broken up, but I begged her to come with me to meet Woody Allen. But you, you weren't married yet? No, I'm okay, not, just, no, I was single. Well, I'm not yeah, judging. Yeah, yeah. So, I begged her, and she knew it was always my dream to meet Woody, and she was right. a Woody fan. And so I saved up money for tickets, I guess, and I arranged for the tickets, and I kept leaving the notes with the stage manager. And finally, it was the night of the performance, and I dropped off a note, Woody, I'll be here tonight, and this is it. So we show up at the theater, and I was so naive, I didn't know you don't go back to see somebody during intermission, that you wait till the end of the show. During intermission, I say to her, let's go, and I go to the stage door, and the stage manager is not in his position, he's not in his seat. Well, so they could go in the middle of the show to go to the back. Exactly. So I grab her hand, we run up the stairs, and I go the wrong way, and I'm on the roof. And I come back down, and the stage manager's there, and he says, can I help you? And I say, Woody's expecting me. And he says, go right in. And I, he says, his dressing room is over there. Remember, these were days when people didn't worry about security, storms, yeah, yeah, sure. anything. Right, right. I go in, his dressing room's empty. He's with Tony Roberts and the whole cast in the dressing room. What was the show, by the way? I, I, it was it played against Sam? I don't really no, know. No, no. So was it played against Sam? Was it a movie? Was it, was no, it was a Broadway it was a play. And then they made it into a movie. Yes. I'm yeah. sorry. Okay, so it was the, you were at the Broadway show. I, it was not. Okay. okay. So, so it was during the intermission. Okay. Right. So, right. So, so now I'm really nervous and I want to chicken out. And she's like, you can't chicken out. You came this far. You have to do it. She was a 12-year-old girl. A so, uh, Asian girl. This girl was hot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I didn't know that. Who knew? Right. Exactly. Right. 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 So I go up to the door and I peek in and Tony Roberts is the, the whole cast. And right. Woody, I see Woody sitting on the couch across the room. And I peek in and I go like this to him, which plays well on the radio. And, he and use his finger and I use my finger to like to come, come over to come me here, Woody. Right? And he goes like this. A right and points I, himself. He points to himself and I said, I shake my head, yes. Yeah. And he comes across the room and he's holding my card and he says to me, You must be Jeff. At that point, I lose it completely because I was so nervous. I'm meeting my idol. Right. And I started saying things to him like, let's open up a day camp and throw winter clothes at people. <laughs> and let's walk low like we used to in Europe. And he looks at the girl I'm with, he goes, this guy's a fucking nut. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized I was blowing the whole thing because yeah, I was yeah. so nervous. I that so, I, so I calmed down and, I, and, I, and he said, why are you here? And I said, well, I, I brought these notes. I had notes. I don't even think they were scripts. They were scraps of paper in an envelope. And he starts to look through them, and he says to me, this is really funny. He goes, but I'm in the midst of a show. Do you think you could come back tomorrow night? Right. And I was like, no, I'm much too busy. <laughs> no, I said, of course, I'll yeah. be here tomorrow. So then the next night, I had to beg the same girl to come back to me because I didn't have the courage. In those days, I thought you were who you had on your arm. Yeah, well, and, it's you know, it's a guy's like it's a self-esteem thing. Yeah, it's you know, a smart thing on your own. I still use today, I do the same show. I'm not married, but I, you want to get in somewhere. Do, yeah, it's but fine. because no one is impressed that men, any schmuck can show up alone. Yeah, right? Right. It doesn't take much talent to show no. up someplace by yourself. Yeah, unless your are painting is George Papard. So. Exactly, which is a reference for 1810, <laughs> but it's okay. So, the stereotypes. Yeah, I'm sorry, so going to the Yes, yes. Yeah. Next so, day you're there. So I show up the next day, it's pouring rain. Okay. I bring the same girl, he meets me after the show. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Now, now that you've gotten the invitation for the album, were you now less nervous? Or, 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 no, I think I was still nervous. nervous. I, I, I don't remember how, I just remember the excitement of, and I was more nervous that she wouldn't come with me, sure. to be honest with you, because it was the second night I had to beg her. Right. And it was pouring rain, and she lived in Co-op City in the Bronx, I had to go get her. Oh. So 
I bring her down, and he sits with me in his dressing room this time, and he looks through everything that I have. That's nice. And he's, it was amazing. Yeah, it was, yeah. Years later, I became friendly with Jack Rollins and Charlie Jaffe, who were his managers. Yeah, right, right. And they said to me, that's such an unusual thing for Woody to have taken his time to do that with you. He must have really seen something. This is like busy. I can't do nothing. I can't do anything. Can't do anything. I can't you ever seen so, Yes, I did. I really? You see my sponsor in the Friars Club. Right. I took it out one time to show me oh, the sure. Friars Club in Los Angeles. I almost tripped over it. I thought a snake got loose. Now, so like, what are you doing with that? For Put our, that away. Here's the thing that breaks my heart. For our audience, um, well, seven of them, <laughs> with the group home, um, they don't know Milton Berlanzi created the really comedy genre on television. He was, mm -hmm. he was the first guy, but he had. And that's why he was called Mr. Television. Right, Mr. Television. Because in the 40s, right. people didn't have TVs. They gathered in the street to literally to watch his show right. through the TV. Win like there were windows of television stores that they would keep the TVs on, and people would stand in the street to and watch, watch it. it. Right. And he sold more TVs than anyone else. That's how he got the name, Mr. Television. But a leg a legendary. I mean, to the point where it's it's a it's a stock. I'm not saying stock anymore, but. He has a huge penis. I mean, he's really right. It's the kind of thing that's that, how I met him from writing jokes about his schwanz. Uh, schwanz. Now, how did that come into play, though? Now, I, I'm going to jump around, but you know, we only have. I, I could talk for four hours, but you're entering it up here. But uh, how do you when you when you, when you how did you meet Milton Berle? Uh, I was writing for the Friars Rose okay. at the time, and I was writing for a comedian named Dick Capri, who was in the show Catskills on Broadway. Okay. And I wrote a joke. Uh, I said, if Burl's cock had a blonde wig, it could pass for Paul Williams. And when Burl heard the joke, he said he was a He said, who wrote the Burl's cock joke? Okay. What he called it. <laughs> and so Dick brought me over to meet him, and we became friends. And then I wrote other jokes that what I did. A, I, I was asked to do a book, which I did. Okay on celebrities' favorite nasty jokes because of my history of writing jokes for so many writers sure. roasts. So I went to Paul Provenza and Paul wrote the forward to the book and okay. I got 250 celebs to tell me nasty shit, right? And um, in it, I wrote some of my own jokes. So I started telling Paul the joke I wrote about Milton Berle, which was Berle would have been here tonight, but he couldn't make it yet. He had a little accident. He was fucking this chick in his hotel room and on his way over to the bed, he accidentally tripped and pole vaulted out the window. <laughs> So before I finish the joke, prevents it interrupts me. He goes, "The pole vaulting joke? You wrote the pole vaulting yeah, joke? Yeah. Like you know the joke? Because everybody knows that joke." Yeah, that joke. So I didn't realize that it had become a classic joke. And I wrote um, other jokes. Of, oh, I said Milton was a very giving man, a very generous man. A lot of people don't know that. Like once he invited me and my family out on his cot for the weekend. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and it's good too because your jokes are. They're visual too. Everything I write tends to be very visual. But that's how I met Milton. We became friends and I wrote for him for, for years. Right. And, uh, you know, he was my sponsor. He was my original sponsor in the Friars Club. Now, when you. It's a great honor to me. Of course it is. Absolutely. Now, getting, getting to where now you're a dentist, okay, and you are on, on the east side. Do this the world of comedy and being a dentist, do you ever. Like, for example, do you have, did you have celebrity patients? Do you yeah, but I, I, I did. Like one time, it happened to be Provenza happened to break, break his tooth on stage. He was in a play called, uh, uh, oh, why can't I remember? I was one of the investors of the play. Wow. Uh, only kidding. Okay. Only kidding. And okay. he was taking a drink from a bottle and he chipped his tooth. We were on the radio together with Jackie Mason, who was guest hosting for Bob Grant. Wow. And he had me and Provenza on, mm -hmm. and we're talking, and all of a sudden Provenza mentions that he breaks his tooth. And he's like, well, why don't you go to Jeffrey? Because why the fuck would I go to a comedy club? Right. Because okay. he also because I never used to tell people. Right. People didn't know. Like when I was writing for Joan Rivers, she found out in the middle of me writing for her, like a few months afterwards. She called me one morning from Vegas. She's like, "What do you do for a living?" I'm like, "I work." She goes, "Well, obviously, but what do you do?" I'm like, "Is this concerning the vicious rumor going around?" Because I knew she had heard. Right. Her assistant saw me on some TV show, and she just asked. And she goes, "Why didn't you ever tell me?" I said, because no one hires you because you're a dentist, they hire you in spite of it. It's an interesting thing, Bean, and you're, you're, you're a funny guy. That's why I started performing a few years ago. For many years, I just wrote for people, now we, and then I started doing comedy. But you wanted to know how I really got started. Yeah, yeah, please. I brought those crazy little films to Saturday Night Live. Oh, no I pulled up in front of 30 Rock. In those days, the street wasn't closed. You could pull up right in front of the building. Okay. So I pulled up in this massive orange Cadillac with a right. Rolls Royce grill, Don't threw mind. the doorman a few bucks, and said, Lauren Michaels is expecting me. Oh, Ran past the NBC security, because in those days, you could do that. Right. Got up to meet Alan Zweibel, who was new yeah. on the show. Yeah, right. yeah, and he was playing handball on the wall of uh, the studio. Sure. 
with Nick so Levy, who was Lauren Michaels' cousin at the time. Is this the original cast? Are we talking? Yeah, original. Okay, so like this early is, days, this is like 77, 76. Okay. This could have been like Albert Brooks was doing his movies, maybe. Well, that, that, that's, that's okay. what okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. happened. Yeah, Albert Brooks was doing his movies at the same time that I was submitting mine. And it was very interesting. So uh, I got to meet Alan, and he looked at my tape, and he sees cream cheese on the ankles, and then this guy's this coat's robbing a hat store. He goes, this is really funny. I've right. never seen stuff like this. So he called his manager, David Jonas. He didn't even give me the number. He called him for me. David Jonas was the guy who discovered Freddie Prinze and got a Chico and the Man. Wow. And in those days, he was he was managing Freddie Roman, who's now the dean of the Friars. Oh, I know Freddie Roman. Yeah. Sure. So so he got me started writing. It took me about a year to learn how to craft a joke because I'm thinking, you know, hundreds of thousands of men disguised as vests rob a soup warehouse, right. which is not a joke. You can't do that on stage. No, no, you you can't. can do that on radio, but you can't do it on right. stage. Animated it's animated. not stand-up. I, no. do, I do a news broadcast right. on stage, but you can't do it as a stand-up thing. No. So I didn't really know how to formulate a joke. And it right. took me about a year of working till I was able to write jokes. Uh, and I started writing for Dick Capri and Freddie Roman, and then Dick introduced me to Rodney Dangerfield. Wow. And then I started writing for Rodney, and he did my stuff on The Tonight Show and on his first album, No Respect. Sure, a huge great album, Cla comedy class. A comedy class, yeah, yeah. yeah, and he wrote, you know, he used the line of mine on that. It was like, you know, yeah, I'll only get ugly girls. You know, I, when I would want a girl, she was so ugly. I bet that to put on cat, it was the hair on her legs. <laughs> it's a very ugly girl. That's good, Rodney, too. Yeah. It's hard to do Rodney. I can't do Rodney. I can't. Yeah. I get these thoughts. People are like, why do you think of those things? Because, you know, GNN is all about unusual stories. Sure. Gurian News Network. I'm familiar with that. I watch some Top really Dancing for the Criminally Insane. And the man, man rubs back with his chin. People are like, why do you even think of that? I'm like, I can't help it. It's right. all I think about, basically. Let's see, Gigo, I do it for me. Right. I have stuff in my house that is just for me. I have balloon soup on the on the stove. If you ever come to visit me, I have pots full of balloons. That's funny. And paper pasta, I, I, you know what? I believe in creating your own happiness center. The world's a crazy place. Uh, sure. When you leave your house, you have no control over what gets put in your path. You're at the mercy of the universe. Right. Okay? The only place you can control your environment is where you live. So I teach people to create their own happiness center. And uh, my apartment is filled with balloons, because you never see balloons at a funeral. We have a few more minutes, but let's do some plugging. So what's okay. what's going on for Jeffrey Green right now? Okay. Uh, I'm launching a new channel. Comedy Matters TV is going on demand, national and international. Good for you. It's, it's great. on Comcast. Uh, within the next few days, it's actually built. We signed the papers a couple of weeks ago. It'll be launching this week or next week. Archive content, uh, new content, guest content. Uh, well, celebrity content. Okay. I, I have a hundred celebrity interviews on my YouTube channel, which okay. is youtube.com slash Gurian News Network. Okay. And it's me and Jimmy Fallon and Chris Rock and John Stewart and people you may have heard of. Of and, course, I've heard of know, um, Me doing interviews with them for Comedy Matters TV. Gotcha. I'm also performing at the Comic Strip on a regular basis. I'm the first official late night host oh, good. at the Comic Strip on Sundays and Monday nights. Okay, cool. And this year, I'm, I'm doing the book on the 35 year history of the comic strip. Okay. That is due in April. It will okay. be out this year. It's in the 2012 catalog. Skyhorse Publishing is publishing the book. And Richie Tinkin and I, who is the owner and founder of the comic strip, same guy, still. the book together. Same guy opened it on June 1st, the 76th. Okay. June 17th, Jerry Seinfeld walked into audition. Okay. So it's the club that launched Seinfeld, Larry Miller, George Wallace. Uh, Louis Black, Susie Big Club. It's a New York club. It's a legendary it's a, it's a club. Legendary and so club. So I'm doing the book on that. Okay. And I'm doing a documentary. You're busy, you're busy. I'm busy. busy. I'm busy. A, lot of, a lot of comedy stuff. But people can see you every Sunday. When do you see a late show? What time of night is that? Sunday night starts at 10 30, Monday okay. at 11. I'm and you host, host you bring people up. Sunday and Monday, I do my material first, mm -hmm. then I bring up the rest of the lineup. And, uh, and I also perform there during the week and at the Gotham Comedy Club. You do, you do Gotham Yeah, too. I do. Those are my two main clubs. So you, who makes you laugh the most? And then we'll do, I'd like to hear your funniest of all time. Well, I, you know, Gilbert Gottfried has always been my favorite. Oh, he's fucking hilarious. Uh, forever. I mean, literally, I used to have to go with paramedics. I would be crying. Yeah, he's His awesome. obscure references are so amazing. He's great. And when I see the old footage of him, he was always the same. He always had his eyes closed. He was always clawing. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. 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 From the beginning. Yeah. I love unique. Uh -huh. I love people who have their own style, which sure. is very hard to find in comedy. Yeah, I mean, everybody looks for their hook. Especially because it works. I mean, you know, there's, look, comedy is a lot like music in that you can take a thousand comedians and put them in the room. Of that thousand, 18 are going to be really funny. Mm -hmm. Truly yeah, funny. Truly funny. We're, we're gut busting. Right. Like, we're you like, know, in comedy, most people don't laugh. When you give a comedian jokes that you wrote, if you're lucky, they're like, 
Oh, that's funny. Right. Oh, that's very funny. Right. I'm hysterical. Right. I'm like, yeah, well, tell your face. And, you know, when you're a young comedy director, you get upset if people are not laughing. Of course, because here it is. But you get used to it. Right. When I'm sitting in the audience, I cover shows for my Comedy Matters vlog all the time. Right. I'm out several nights a week covering shows. It's very rare that I'm going to laugh out loud for people. You know, what shows I like, is that I like Anthony Anderson's mixtape comedy show at Gotham. It's a killer show once a month. You know who you were involved with who was just fucking blown up? Is that Kevin Hart? Kevin Hart. I, I had the good fortune to produce him in yeah. 2010. I saw that. I co-produced the show with him, Kevin, Tony Rock, and Will Sylvain. Sure. We sold that Westbury in minutes. Yeah, it's it amazing. Like 3,000 seats. I, I just interviewed him again last week. Did you? At the strip, he came in for an interview for Black History Month. Sure. And so we're friends now, so yeah. we did a nice little exclusive. He's a very sure he's, readers will see. It's funny, but he's also he's a very, he kind of gets it, and he's a hard-working guy. And those, he's so hard Yeah, and, and he comes home. from a good place. Yeah. He has a really good heart, this guy. And he's like, I'm happy for him for his success. Yeah. But he blew up. He, yeah, he did. Every show he does sells out. Yeah. Whether it's, you know, I saw him last year at the South Beach Comedy Festival, right. too. All the shows. But also, the black audiences are incredibly loyal to people that Better. Love, you Better. Know, He's got that. 3 million followers on Twitter. Yeah. Incredible. And one white follower. Yes, me. <laughs> I follow him right now. Me too. Yeah, so two of us. Two of us. Right. Well, but we, sh we share it. I'll unfollow him, then you can follow him. I'll unfollow him, you can But you're right, though. Black audiences yeah. are very loyal. They really and come it, out for the for and people And they like big numbers, too. And even that, yeah. and that's what we need to make that. I mean, you, that, I mean, you must have done really well that was for a show. I can only imagine. You know? we, we, we sold out. Yeah. We and sold yeah. out, and it was an amazing experience. It was it was a very, very exciting experience. Okay, so let's do So, I like Gilbert of the Young Comics, man. It's hard. I, I like Mike Vecchione. Yeah. I like Kurt Metzger. Yeah, Kurt's a very different one. Yeah, so yeah. He's not the show. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It comes from a place. It's just a unique delivery. Yeah. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's um, real. I like John Fish is very funny. Okay. I like... Um, I'm trying to, I, this is going to sound terrible because they're a name, Ted Alexandro. Ted, Ted's doing the show next week. Very clever, yeah. Uh, well, so we have good taste. Yeah. I'm honored to be on the show. Yeah, for sure. We have, uh, guys. They're, 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 they're all, you know, um, when I do a show, these are people that I ask to be on my sure, show. I did a diabetes fundraiser last year because I like to use comedy for charity as well. Sure, of course. It's a great way to raise money. Yeah. And we did a big fundraiser last year. Ted was on the show. Uh, John Fish, as I said. Yeah, Jim Andrinos. Um, we had a, a really good, uh, uh, Kyle Grooms is very funny, okay. Maceo, you know Maceo? Uh, a, a lot of these guys, he, he was the one who started Uptown Comedy. Oh, okay. Um, great, great okay. entertainer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Let me ask you a question, yeah. of all time, who do you think? Find the... W.C. Fields. Wow, really? I, mean, I was such a Fields freak. That's great. Yeah, he influenced me so much. My, 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 my Funniest man ever. Yeah, yeah. My, my father is a huge W.C. Fields fan, and I remember the great, uh, I just remember, I remember what movie was it? It's not going to play well on radio, but there's a, a, a little kid came up to him and talked to his audience. He hated the kid. He hated kids and animals. Yeah, and it was well. really funny, but he was so he was really a graceful guy. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I have to say W.C. Fields. And really, I mean, Laurel, some early, early, early Laurel Hardy. They were hysterical. Yeah. But you could never do that again today. Yeah. The world has changed too much. Two guys could never walk into an agent's office anywhere and tell them we have a two-man act. No, it doesn't. Who was the last two-man act? I can't think of anything. No, no, uh, two-man act. I'm just kidding. Everything I know. Oh, uh, no. Or the Moss Brothers. You could never have that anymore. Sure. A lot of people don't know. I'm also an inventor. You know, I invented the flashlight that works during the day. You know, well, why should people only see at night? This way you could You're use, you know, the battery-operated beard. What I, will, what I will tell you is when, what we do is with this show, um, this is really going to be boring for the audience for me to explain this, but we are going to take you, I know you have some really funny radio bits and things like that, and we're going we're gonna to do about a solid 10-minute block. So can I tell you about the battery-operated beard? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> because you know yourself. Look, it's a trend these days. Yeah. Like a lot of hot models want to hang out with guys with biblical length oh, beards. Not just the ZZ Top, Methuselah yeah. length beards. Exactly. Right? But they want them to swim. Uh -huh. And you know, years ago, you'd have to plug your beard in. When uh -huh. you went, it was like, because they didn't have anything else. You'd have to plug your beard. You go to a hot party, you see a girl across the room, you, you gotta find an album. Oh, now you plug your beard in, and you're crossing the dance floor, and maybe another guy sees her, and the next thing you know, there's extension cords all across the dance floor, you can't dance. It's a, it's a hell 
Now there's a battery operated beard that I invented okay. where you just you don't have to plug your beard in at all and your beard can swing for hours. Double A, double A, what's the, um, Two double A's that's and that's it. And your beard can swing and you can meet all the girls you want. How about for Shabbos? It changed for Shabbos. You turn on Friday and it goes to Shabbos. I have a, a, a reversible beard oh, nice. for men who want to pack light when they go on vacation. You, you know, and you know when you get there you're going to want a change of beard. Okay. This is, this is perfect. A beard that comes with a detachable hood for the winter. I have a, a, an incredible line, line of beard. I it, just wanted to say that. And maybe we'll see it on there. What is the name? Give me the thing again with, uh, on Comcast. GNN. Guri, well, on Comcast, it's Comedy Matters TV. Okay. If you want to see those stories, you should look on my Gurian News Network website, which is www.guriannewsnetwork.com. I particularly enjoy the, most the usual stories in the world. It's all the news that's fit to dance to. I, I very much enjoy the George Washington with the wooden pants. Wooden pants, well, I very much. So I recommend to the audience listen to that. Listen, we got to, I got to wrap you up. It's been a real pleasure having you in. We're gonna have it's you back. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, good. So I'm Brian McCarthy. That's Jeffrey Curry. This is the National Lampoon Network on the Talking Shit Network with Jim Jeffries and Andy Gift. I'm your host, Brian McCarthy. See you later, motherfuckers. Thank you very much for doing our show. Well, it was a pleasure. You are a great interviewer. You just kept it going right over. I like that kind of energy. Yes. It just works, man. All, it totally all, works. It's, it's all I can do. <laughs> I, uh, would, I wish I had a skill. <laughs> Please. You've got a skill, Thank and you. I would love to come back anytime you'll have me. Mm -hmm. great. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Jeffrey Curry, everybody. Thank you.